Whether you operate one forklift or thousands, one location or hundreds, the new My Toyota customer portal can help you optimize your operation and material handling equipment. This one-stop, free-to-use platform is designed to help you take control of your information and make smarter decisions, all at the touch of a button. Register and access your data today at my.toyotaforklift.com. That's my.toyotaforklift.com. Today's warehouse needs to keep inventory moving smoothly and quickly. Meet these challenges with on-demand warehouse labeling from Brother Mobile Solutions. Our mobile and industrial printers will help optimize your operations to achieve the speed, reliability, and durability your warehouse needs. With easy integration for existing warehouse technology, convenient portability, and upfront affordability, Brother Mobile Solutions is at your side when it comes to warehouse labeling. Try one for free today by visiting brothermobilesolutions.com slash newwarehouse or click the link in the show notes. That's it's brothermobilesolutions.com slash new warehouse to try one for free today. The New Warehouse Podcast, hosted by Kevin Lawton, is your source for insights and ideas from the distribution, transportation, and logistics industry. A new episode every Monday morning brings you the latest from industry experts and thought leaders. And now, here's Kevin. Hey, it's Kevin Lawton with the New Warehouse Podcast, bringing you a new episode today. On today's episode, I'm going to be joined by Amin Sikander, and he is the president and co-founder at Syncrato. And Syncrato is working on digital twins, and there's a lot of discussion around digital twins in the in the factory and manufacturing and life in general, and also in the warehouse, which we're going to talk about today. And we're going to learn a little bit more about that, and we're going to dive into a little bit how digital twins and AI can interact. There's a lot of talk about AI as well, and I'm curious how that's going to come into play. In, in the warehousing world. And we're also going to talk about the living digital twin versus a static digital twin, which uh, I could not tell you what the difference is myself. So Amin is going to tell us today. So Amin, welcome to the show. How are you? Good, Kevin. Thank you so much for having me. Very excited to be here and talking to you. Definitely happy to have you on. Happy to be talking about this topic and obviously happy too, as well. You told me before we started recording here that you're a fellow warehouse geek. So uh, it's always good to get uh, one of those on this show, especially a show about uh, warehousing, you know, the, the ultimate geek out, right? So, uh, so welcome to the show. And why don't you tell us a little bit about your, your background? You're the co-founder at Syncrato. So uh, I'm curious about your background and, and how that kind of led to you founding this company. Yeah, no, great question, Kevin. I've been either building or implementing warehouse management systems for, uh, God knows, 25 plus years now. Okay. Started my career off at a best of breed MS company called EXC. It was now part of Infor through a few different okay. acquisitions. Okay. Right? Um, and then Oracle hired me back in 99 to be one of their primary architects of their WMS system, the on-prem version that they were building back then. Mm. I did that for you know, seven years or so. I then left to start my company called Gaia. Okay. Um, that was primarily a systems implementer, right? We would go on and implement supply chain and project control solutions for clients all over the world. Um, about 400 people worldwide right now uh, help mm. execute global supply chain projects all, all over. So we've been doing that for about 15 years and Syncrato was kind of born out of that, right? Okay. Being an implementation partner and having done this with multiple different customers, multiple different industries, there was you know, a result of two things. One, frustration of having to solve the same problems over and over again on an mm-hmm. ad hoc basis for yeah. all these clients, right? <laughs> and second, and I'm sure you can relate to this, yeah. there's always a relation, oh, you know, why can't I do that? I mean, it'd be cool if I can do this, right? right. If I can use yeah. this technology, for that, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> that's kind of how uh, Syncrato was born. We said, like, you know what? We're at a position now where we, we feel we can invest and build on a product that really can solve some of these problems that we've been trying to attack on a one-off basis. 
Mm. All right. Very interesting. And, and certainly you, you've definitely had your, your experience there with the, the warehouse management side and, and implementation side, maybe one of the potentially scariest words in the warehouse world, implementation, right? Yeah. Uh, definitely can yeah. be <laughs> painful in some aspects. I've been through a few myself, but I think you, you had a really interesting thing there where, you know, people say, oh, well, why can't I do this with this? Or like, this would be really cool if we could do this. And it's, you know, it's easier said than, than done, I think. So, so it's interesting that you're kind of taking that and, and bringing that into this this new company here that you've founded and, and what you guys are doing. So tell us a little bit about, because you talked about your implementation background, WMS background, but but what are you actually doing now with Syncrato? So Syncrato, I guess the easiest way to describe it is a next-gen logistics platform. Mm-hmm. And I know okay. it's a buzzword that everybody uses, yeah. but the way we think <laughs> about it is dealing about um, warehousing 5.0, right? Mm-hmm. That is so. 4.0 is all about digitization, yeah. about automation, about using all these autonomous robots, AI, all these really cool technology. Perhaps not to the extent that you know, that we would like to see in, in the supply chain space, right? Mm-hmm. Um, to us, you know, WMS 5.0 you know, means slightly different things to certain people. Mm-hmm. To us, really, it's about rethinking how we as humans interact with that technology, right? Mm-hmm. It's not okay. about... It's not. It's about leveraging existing technology. I mean, all of this has been there for a while, right? Uh, I mean, RFID has been around for like 30, 40 years now yeah. or more, yeah. right? And digital twins and the technology to build digital twins have been around for a while. When we looked at the the landscape, and you were at Promat, I, I believe, right? Uh, oh, yeah. Kevin, there's yeah. all these really cool technologies out there, right? Not a whole lot of customers are adopting it just yet. There's, there's, there are mm-hmm. few, but there's a lot more adoption that we feel now can be achieved, right? And when we're thinking about this, that's kind of really the foundation of a platform, right? And and there's mm. five core aspects to it, if you can okay. explain. Sure. One is an integration layer, because you know, for any company that wants to be a technology enabler, an any to any integration platform is kind of like a table stakes thing. Right? You need to be mm. able to stitch together these technologies to your ERP. That's what gives you the most value, right? And and be able to talk with different systems, you know, RFID, IoT, you know robotics, all of that, and take that back to ERP. So that's that's kind of our foundational layer, if you will. Okay. Right? And then first thing we did was we started off with labeling, which okay. and people always ask me, why, why labeling? You know, yeah. right? and you as a warehousing geek probably understand that. Oh, yeah. yeah. But to us, that is the most fundamental unit of a supply chain, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and by label, I'm not just talking about you know, 2D or, or linear barcodes. I'm using it loosely, right, to encompass like, you know, RFID tags and IoT device tags and all of that, right? Okay. But essentially, we started with that because, again, this is a problem we were addressing over and over again. The existing landscape for labeling was focused on within an enterprise, mm-hmm. right? If you if you make it, you build it, and you, and you distribute it, great. Now, there's plenty of also great software out there that can help you achieve that, right? Mm-hmm. What we were focused on was was kind of building this multi-business enterprise network just for labels, right? Like like the, okay. the typical Walmart problem, right? Uh, yeah. When Walmart asks you to design a label for it, they still send you a PDF guide, yeah. right? <laughs> and, you know, all these thousands of suppliers have to recreate these labels and then mm-hmm. send it to Walmart or Google or whoever it may be for approval. Very time-consuming, and I still can't believe we're doing this in the year 2023, but yeah. that's the problem we were trying to address, right? Okay. And besides, that to us was like a, a critical component in bridging the physical to digital divide, right? And if you're creating digital twins and digital things, you need to establish a link between the physical object and the digital entity. Mm. And how how better to do that than at the source when you're actually labeling things, right? right? So that's kind of the approach we took. The second was around mobility. And when we build this platform, we wanted to build this not just for the large, sophisticated enterprises at level three, four, and five, but we also want this to be accessible to the level one and level two, uh, less sophisticated warehouse, like you know, stock rooms and, and pop-up warehouses and things like that. Yeah. And at that level of the market, the problem was flexibility, right? There's all these great you know, SaaS software out there that you, know, you can leverage, but you kind of have to live with what they provide you, right? What mm. we built was a no-code platform, right, okay. that allows you to build these mobile transactions that can work 
with multiple enterprise systems or your legacy system, right? And, and then establish mobility for you pretty quickly at low cost, mm-hmm. right? And then brings us to the, the third and the, the, the piece that we here talk about primarily, which is AI and the digital twin, right? Okay. One, it, we started with AI, actually, because we wanted to solve, you know, one of the most complex problems in, in logistics, which is slotting, right? Figuring out oh, where to put yeah. products. I've done a lot right? of slotting projects in my day, yeah. Yep, yep. And we've done this on a manual basis over and over again, Kevin. But the problem yeah. was you do it once and then, you know, your business changes, right? Your, your demand patterns change, your supply oh, yeah. uh, patterns change. And it's too expensive and hard to do as it exists today, mm-hmm. right? And to us, that was a classic AI problem, right? If we can define an AI model that can take all those inputs and constantly look at your your your, your warehouse layout and warehouse model, mm-hmm. that's a far better approach to slotting uh, than a one-off uh, ad hoc method, right. right? So when we started building that, we quickly realized that we needed a digital twin. Okay. <laughs> a digital replica of the warehouse that will feed into the AI engine. Yeah, I mean, I, it makes total sense. And I, I love that you say you, you kind of started from the position of the label. And, you know, somebody I had previously on the podcast told me, said something and it always kind of stuck with me is that the the label is like the the passport to the supply chain, right? It's like it makes helps yep. you make that transition for that material, like all the way through, whether it's, you know, just a standard right. paper label on there with a regular barcode or like you said, it's a RFID yep. or an IoT sensor or something of that nature. I mean, I think that makes total sense. And I and I love that you're focused on the, the slotting aspect as well, because I've spent a few, uh, maybe more than a few late nights doing some some slotting projects from for like initial warehouse setups and then existing ones. And you, like you said, I mean, it's so much work to, to try and get the right. slotting right and, and figure it out. And, and you know, how is it going to fit? And it makes sense with our current existing racking and, and layout and, and all those things and, you know, allocating enough space for, you know, enough days on hand in, in that slot. But then, you know, it could be totally different in like a week later or, or two weeks right. later. It's like, right. you don't have the bandwidth to, to do that kind of manual process all the time, all that data analysis and everything. So, so I, that makes so much sense to me utilizing AI for that. But I, I want to take a, a step back here before we dive into the kind of digital twin and, and AI here for a second, because you mentioned something in the beginning that we said, you know, we, we've we kind of gone through the warehouse 4.0, right, with the digitization and now on to the warehouse 5.0 is where you're pushing towards. But I, I'm curious because, you know, you mentioned ProMat in there. I mean, certainly there's, there's a ton of tech going on there, automation, robotics, you know, name the kind of tech and, you know, humanoid robotics, even there, like tons right. of crazy stuff that a couple of years ago, we probably would not imagine would, would be there. Right. But I mean, how do you, cause I think oftentimes from a system perspective, you know, as operators, we're, we're a little scared to like go for that, that newer, newer technology. Right. So, I, I mean, I think there's still a lot of people that are still kind of figuring their way through industry or warehouse 4.0, as you said, you know, how are you kind of approach them and say like, Hey, let's, let's be open to this, you know, warehouse 5.0 and, you know, it's time to start to utilize this, this technology more and, you know, don't, don't be scared of it. Basically. How do, how do you approach that? Well, like, I mean, to us, that's exactly that, right? Mm-hmm. It, warehouse 5.0 is not about, you know, necessarily bringing in new technology when we're still trying to you know implement the ones that we already have it's fundamentally mm-hmm. about how do you humanize it how do you make sure that it's more human centric and that we're better able to interact with these different technologies right yeah. and it's a problem we struggle with as a society you know, outside you know logistics but that's fundamentally it it's about we have all these cool technology and the ROI for all these have come down to a point where it makes sense Mm. People that are still turned off though by the complexity uh, and the fear that you now okay, I already have a DMS and I don't want to break anything, but how do I bring all this stuff in? And it's too complicated. I don't want to build my own IT team to support this forever. Yeah. And that's kind of what we're trying to bridge, right? We have all these technologies. You know, we have a platform that will enable you to utilize them better, mm. not necessarily you know, bring in a completely different type of technology, Web3 or, or any of that, but really leveraging the technology that's already been out there for a few years and using that to drive your business. Mm, okay. All right. Interesting approach. And yeah, I think, I think that's smart. And, uh, you know, 
I think the more we look at our space in the warehouse industry, you know, certainly, and, you know, I was talking about, you know, trying to do this data analysis on sliding and things like that, and, you know, being able to, to leverage those technologies is certainly a great thing to, to make that easier and, and more efficient and make it happen more often when it, when it really should happen. So, so very interesting there. So, so let's talk a little bit about, cause ultimately you guys are, are focusing on digital twin and, and AI, but mm-hmm. for, for those that maybe are, are not familiar, have heard this term floating around. I mean, what, what is a, a digital twin? We'll be back after a quick break. You hear a lot about supply chains these days, because if the past couple years have taught us anything, it's that an efficient, well-managed supply chain is absolutely critical to keeping businesses successful and consumers happy. I'm Will Haywood, and I host a podcast called All Business, No Boundaries, where we talk about supply chains, how they work, what happens when they don't, and the innovations that are redefining what's possible in the world of logistics. Join me for insightful interviews with thought leaders and industry experts. We discuss how optimizing supply chains can break down the barriers that are holding businesses back. That's All Business, No Boundaries by DHL Supply Chain. Listen and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Well, at its most basic definition, right? A digital twin is a virtual representation of a physical object, right? Mm. It could be an item. Could be a, a system, could be a process, or it could be an, a, a machinery, or it could be automated equipment, or it could be an entire facility. Uh, essentially, you know, when we were looking at it, what we are focusing on is create, we created a platform that allows you to create a digital replica of your facility, whether it's a manufacturing facility or, or a warehousing facility, right? Mm-hmm. And again, goes back to this whole idea of being able to interact with with technology better, right? And we would think when we're thinking about this cyber human bridge, if you will, yeah. right? I don't know if that's a word, but you know, um, <laughs> we, we started off with a multitude of different technologies, Kevin. Uh, we looked at, you know, CAD, AutoCAD, Revit, and uh, all the other tools that were mm-hmm. out there. But then we, we thought about it and said, no, let's, let's go back to an industry that's been doing this exceptionally well for the last 30, 40 years, and that's the, the video gaming industry. Right, mm-hmm. they've done a phenomenal job of you know getting people to into the video games, into virtual reality, and all of that. Right, so right. We, we 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 went back to drawing board and we decided to use Unity, the, the gaming platform that's mm-hmm. used to build a, a okay. whole bunch of different games today, and use that as a platform really to build our digital twin. And the, the theory being, you know, if you can create a world in Minecraft, you can create a, a digital replica of your 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 facility in, in a couple of days using our platform. Mm-hmm. Okay. Interesting. And, you know, certainly something that I think, you know, the digital twin in the warehousing space is, is such a, a great thing because, you know, we think about the, the projects that we want to do and, and the things that we want to simulate to, to try and, and test them physically can draw a ton of resources. It can be disruptive to operations, which, you know, if we close down a warehouse for any length of time. I mean, it, it can right, be right, right. catastrophic to the business, right? So it, you, you don't want to do that. And you also don't want to pour a lot of money into to testing something that's not going to work, or maybe just being scared to test something because you don't want to, to break something or you don't want to throw money into it. Uh, so the digital twin like makes so much sense in our space because you're able to kind of do those tests and, and tweak things right. around, run some simulations and things like that, which is a, a great thing, right? But now he, we're talking a little bit about, and this is something that you mentioned you want to, to point out to us, because I, I, I'm not so familiar with this. I mean, I'm familiar with the digital twin and the, the concept and seen some and, you know, all these different things. But what's the difference between a, a living digital twin and a, a static digital twin? Well, his, historically, most digital twins, more software that allows you to create these digital twins, were used primarily for, for planning purposes, mm. right? To do exactly that, you know, if you're creating a warehouse, you now let's, let, let's do this layout and see how that works, uh, an architectural diagram sort of things, okay. to simulate like a machinery mm. and uh, an ASRS, how is it going to work and all, that kind of planning options really. To us, a living digital twin is a little bit beyond that because it ingests data from multiple systems and sources, right? From IoT, mm-hmm. from RFID, from your ERP to present an actual accurate real-time picture of your, not only your warehouse, but your inventory and resources as well. 
that, that's kind of the difference to us between a static and a, and a living digital twin. Got it. So, so for like a living digital twin, if I were to pull up my digital twin and it was living, right? And yep. I would basically be seeing if there was movement from equipment that had IoT sensors on it or RFID, exactly. I would see it in real time as things are changing within the operation is basically yep. Yep. the difference. Yep. Okay. Whereas yep. static would be just like, like you said, an architectural diagram, right? Correct. Okay. All right. Interesting. Right. Yeah. So, so obviously the, the living I could see is, is more beneficial. So, I mean, is that more what, what you're focusing on yeah. with Syncrado? Yes, absolutely. Right. Because mm-hmm. one, it enables things like augmented reality picking, right? Mm-hmm. Now, uh, anytime, you know, one of the things that's always bugged me about the warehousing space, Kevin, is that most people are seem to be operating with one hand, right? You're, you're constantly scanning stuff yeah. <laughs> uh, with this kind of, and then pulling it down, picking things up and then scanning again, right? So uh, I think AR has a potential to change that, right? Especially married to the digital twin at a much lower cost than a true RTLS system, for example, would end mm-hmm. up, right? Mm-hmm. Because, you know, RTLS system, you're going to need, you know, you know, wireless sensors and, and, and tags and all that. All the tags are pretty inexpensive nowadays. Yeah. Still, for a fairly large warehouse, that's a significant investment, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, whereas if you had a, a, a digital replica of your warehouse and you're using AR, the very fact that you, you're walking through a warehouse and you're looking at things, that matches to where you actually are. Right. You're picking up things. We know exactly what you're picking up because you're looking at through your glass, right? And, mm-hmm. and you're moving it. So it's to us, it's a more intuitive way of, of doing warehousing yeah. right, going forward. Hmm. Interesting. And it's interesting you touched on the, the AR there. I mean, do you think, because I've tried some of the augmented reality stuff, some of the glasses mm-hmm. and, and headsets and stuff. I mean, it it's a little different, like from, from an operator yes. standpoint, right? So, I, I mean, how do you, what are your thoughts on how do we make that experience like a little more comfortable for like a long shift? And, and how do we make it so that it's, you know, it, it's not such a strange experience i guess for you yes. know versus what people are normally used to yeah yeah and i think it took a bad rap kevin with the, the, the google glass and all the yeah like, the, <laughs> the, the lack of uh you know the, the, or the negativity around surrounding that right but there are companies out there you know zebra real work a whole bunch of companies that yeah. have uh, advanced this technology quite a lot right mm-hmm. and i believe you know i used to say whether well, it's dhl or somebody else that did an experiment with with ar and measured productivity with and without and it was significantly better mm-hmm. I, I had to go back and check which one that was but yes it absolutely has a potential to to increase productivity drastically mm-hmm. it does take some getting used to but we believe that technology is there to to really make it a better experience than what what it used to be right and the digital twin that we are thinking of it's it enables AR, but it doesn't require AR, right? Mm-hmm. If you have AR and you're using, if you have, that, that's great. Um, whereas if you just want to start with your simple mobile scanning, now it works for that as well. Uh, our, our goal is to build a platform that allows you to scale and leverage the technology that works for you and your warehouse at the end, your level of sophistication, really. Mm, okay. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think it's a, a great point about the AR. I mean, I mean, I do see the the potential there, certainly, you know, like you said, I mean, you know, you're operating with one hand, you have a, a thing, yeah. you put it down, you you put it in on a pallet in the location, you forget about it, you got to go back to the location or you lose it for like weeks at a time. Right, right. So, it, you know, I mean, there's certainly a lot of potential there when you, in any type of use case where you're able to, to free up both those hands and, and improve that productivity and, and safety overall too, I think. So it'd be interesting to see how that, that develops. And, you know, I, I'm definitely interested. I think, you know, we're both guys that wear glasses here. So it's a little yeah. interesting too, trying to make that work with the, the existing glasses. Right, situation. right, right. No, <laughs> I had struggled with the Google Glass myself. Yeah. But, you know, th- things have progressed quite a bit since that. Are they there all the way yet? Probably not, Kevin, but I think mm-hmm. we are close to a point where they absolutely will be yep. completely comfortable for people to use for long periods of uh, time. Interesting. Yeah, I'll be I'll be waiting to to try that and, and throw those on definitely. <laughs> so we're talking about the digital twin, right? Which is certainly something that you guys are focused on, and it makes so much sense, as I said before, for the the warehousing industry. And then I, I think you know. Digital twin certainly is one of the big buzzwords or buzz terms around the industry or in, in general, right? And and then oftentimes, you know, we also see the other big buzzword, which is which is huge all over the place now, is AI, right? And, and how that's coming into right. play with the ChatGPT and, and all those different things, right? And and you know. 
know, AI replacing people's jobs and, and all those different things. So, so tell us a little bit about how, cause you, you guys are focusing on the, the digital twin aspect, but then also kind of marrying that with the AI as well. So tell us how the, the digital twin and now AI can kind of function, work together and, and help to Im- improve those warehouse operations. So th- there's two two aspects of this, and I think they both go hand in hand, Kevin. Mm-hmm. The, the, the one that I talked about earlier is really the, the optimization of the product problem, right? And if you're really doing slotting, you, you, you essentially what are you trying to do? You're trying to minimize your picking cost, right? I mean, yeah. half your, half your, I'm using very rough numbers here, but you know, half of a typical warehouse cost is labor. I yeah. think about half of that is auto fulfillment, right? And it comes down to really travel time and, and, and picking time, right? So you're going to need your, your sales history because you need to predict, you know, what your order profiles are, what your SKU affinities are, and what type of picking you're doing, right? You, you need also the warehouse configuration that calculates based on a pathfinding algorithms, the actual travel time and optimization paths for each of those locations in the warehouse. You, you can do it manually, but then, you know, if you're doing simulations, if you want to add, if you want to do things like, I want to add a rack here, you know, what's that going to do to my yeah. starting plan, right? Will it increase my, my picking productivity? Or if I add a conveyor belt here, and reduce my, my, my travel time, is that enough of a return on my investment to justify that, right? Those kind of answers that can only be obtained by, you know, this link between the, the digital twin and the AI feeding each other. The way we, the, our, our engine works is the digital twin is initially an input, one of the inputs, the AI engine, apart from the sales history, demand forecast, uh, all of that stuff, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, we come up with a baseline slotting plan. Okay. Uh, and we, that's fed back to, into the digital twin, but then that needs to reflect what actually happened, right? Because the starting plan is not what we hope will happen based on yeah. our, our <laughs> optimal uh, placement. Mm. But then, you know, people behave in different ways. People pick in different ways based on the warehouse. Yeah. And we need the data back from the digital twin to kind of have a, a self-correcting and feedback mechanism to say, okay, you know what? We thought putting this here would save you so much time, but looking at what you're actually doing, mm. that's not what's happening. So let's refine the model to figure out where else to put it. So that's our objective in linking these two together, right? That's one, that's the optimization part of it. The second piece of it is the actual execution piece of it, right? Now, if you have a digital tool and you have an A engine that can orchestrate your resources and both human and autonomous robots or any MHE, right? Mm -hmm. If you can orchestrate that based on your your bucket of tasks that you're, you're executing, things that every warehouse manager does on a daily basis today, some way, shape or form. Yeah. Like if we can give you the tools to do that better, that's kind of where we see these two fitting in. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that makes a ton of sense. And like you said, the, you know, you, you do try and come up with this, this ideal scenario, like this is how things are right. going to get picked, but, but, you know, at the end of the day, I mean, a lot of times the, the people that are actually doing the picking are, are coming up with the some of the the better improvements. And if you have something that can, yeah. can see that in in real time, like you, you created here, and, and being able to to adjust based on that, and, and then make suggestions to to how do we kind of tweak these things and, and try something a little different, or you know maybe put this this type of product over here instead of over here because you know people are, are tending to go to this one first instead of this one first because of the way it's gets built on the pallet or, or something like that. I mean, right. you know, right. being able to see that kind of, you know, detail and, and granularity as a, a person is, is tough, especially as, you know, resources become leaner and leaner. So, so leaning on AI to be able to, to see those things for you and see them probably a lot sooner than you would as a, a person, I, I think makes a, uh, makes a lot of sense. Yep. So it's really, really smart technology and a great way to, to apply this tech to, to our industry and, and be able to, to focus on really helping to create that kind of underlying optimization and, and improvement that oftentimes, you know, we kind of smaller things that we kind of overlook in, in a sense, because we're, yeah. we're running around yeah. worrying about, you know, fires yeah. and, and things like that in the, the warehouse. So, so really interesting stuff from you, I mean, here and really interesting what you guys are doing with, with Syncrato. And I'd be interested to see how that continues to, to develop and how people start to adopt that. So I'm curious before we close out here, I mean, how, like if companies are, are listening to this and, you know, they want to start harnessing these, these technologies in, in their operation, I, I mean, how, how would they do that and, and how, 
I mean, how far off, I guess maybe the, the bigger question is how far off are we from, you know, I think right now we talked about programming, like everybody's coming and saying like, okay, like I need automation, right? I, I need robotics. Mm -hmm. You know, how far off are we from people saying like, Hey, I need digital twin. I need AI. Like this is something that we have to have in order to, to compete. I think we're pretty close to the inflection point. Like, yeah. As you said, right? People are looking for automation, yeah. driven mainly by labor costs, but more critically, labor availability, right? That's a big problem for us right now, right? And, and everybody recognizes that they're going to have to adopt some level of automation, right? The yeah. key is there's, there's still this fear of, you know, how do I make this work with my ERP? That, that versus the key. Because at the end of the day, it has to work with your existing investments, you know. It, asking them to rip it out and rebuild from scratch or building an entire IT team to support and maintain this is, is going to be a hard thing to, to get approval for budget wise, yeah. right? That's kind of, I think, you know, where these platforms like us that actually simplifies the use and enables the use of that technology in conjunction with the ERP. I think as they adopt more and more automation, that's going to be more of, a, of a, like a table stakes thing for a lot of companies that you mm. have to have some kind of simplification layer. Otherwise, it's just too complicated to do and maintain, more importantly. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a really great point there because it is it is getting more and more complex in, in our world. It's so yeah. much more than, you know, box in, box out. There's so much going on in between, right? So, right, so right, having right. having that simplified layer, like you're saying, makes makes total sense. And it's great that you, you've you recognized that from your your experience and, and time in the industry and, and now have created that through Syncrado to, to be able to help warehouse operations to have that simplification and, and like you said, be able to, to simulate test things and, and understand what's really happening to, to really optimize fully and, and make those improvements that everybody wants to, to make and increase that efficiency overall. So really, really interesting stuff from you here, I mean, and, and definitely happy to have learned about Syncrado today. And if people are interested in learning more about Syncrado, how can they do that? Oh, our website is probably the best place to start. Syncrado.com, that's S-Y-N-K-R-A-T-O.com. All right, great. And we'll definitely put all that information at the newhouse.com as well so people can easily find it. So, Amin, thank you for your time on the show today. You've been listening to the New Warehouse Podcast with Kevin Lawton. Subscribe and check us out online at thenewwarehouse.com. Thank you for listening to this episode. If you want more content from The New Warehouse, check out our new video series called All Hands on LinkedIn. Just search for The New Warehouse on LinkedIn and follow along.